You can now follow me on all my social media platforms to find out who my latest guest will be. And don't forget to click the subscribe button and the notifications button so you're notified for when my next podcast goes live. It was rough enough living there in, in Tiger's Bay at that, at that time. I seen, I was, uh, it was a rat at the bottom of my street um, where a kid, Glenn Branagh, blew, blew himself up um, with a pipe bomb, trying to throw a pipe bomb, short fuse, blew the back of his head off. I got involved in a few rats, um, not because I was a bad person, just because it was exciting and it was happening at the bottom of my street. How is the relationship with the McGuigans now? I wouldn't fucking piss on them if they were on fire. I genuinely mean it, hate them. Boxing's a fucking such a dirty business, mate. Mm -hmm. And people talk to me about what I want to do after and maybe managing fighters or coaching. I, I, I know now for a fact I'll never manage or coach a fighter <laughs> just because there's too much yeah. bullshit and yeah. politics involved. Boom, we're on. <laughs> and today's guest, we've got Carol Frampton. How are How you, brother? Doing, mate? Nearly wrecked that mix. <laughs> Punching again? Yeah, yeah. How's things? All right, just... I'm in Manchester, in the middle of a training camp, just getting ready for the next fight. Really, that's it. All's good, though. Two-weight world champion. Just announced a fight there to be Ireland's first time possible ever three-weight world champion. How mm. does that make you feel? <sighs> it's huge, isn't it? It's a massive that's opportunity mega. for me. There's not... Um, there's no one on the island of Ireland has ever done it, become a three-bit world champion. So me, Steve Collins, and Katie Taylor are the three fighters that have done that so far, won titles in two divisions. But the stand alone as the only three-weight would be huge. And there's only been three Brits in front of me that has done it. Um, one of them, your countryman, Ricky Burns, and the add my name to that list as well. It's, it's, it's humongous. And probably... you're. You're close to the Hall of Fame, man. You know what I mean mm -hmm. with with doing that. So that's the plan. That's next level stuff. I know. I, I never imagined it. Like I've I've kind of I just never imagined that I could do as much. So I've kind of I've overachieved in a sense. You know what I mean. Mm -hmm. I wanted to be a world champion. That was it. But I've done it in two divisions and I unified and and everything else that's went with it. So fair play. Yeah. Especially coming from Northern Ireland as well. I always go back to the start with my guests where you grew up and how it all began. Yeah, I grew up in a place called Tigers Bay, um, which is very, very close to the city centre in Belfast. Um, a full-on loyalist uh, neighbourhood. I lived in a, in a street called Upper Canning Street, which was... So, Tigers Bay is here. The next, the next housing estate is the New Lodge, which is full-on Republican. And I lived in Upper Canning Street, which was the closest street in Tigers Bay to the New Lodge. So I lived on an interface. Like I, I used to just see all the mad shit going mm -hmm. on when I was a kid. Um, but I got started in boxing when I was seven. The local club was a two-minute walk from the front door. So I wasn't from a big boxing family or anything like mm -hmm. that. I was just curious. I wanted to try it out and, and see what it was like. And literally, you, know, you hear the story. Like people fall in love with things. And I fell in love with boxing like pretty early on. Yeah, was it tough? Was it in the troubles back then in the 80s? Oh, yeah. So I grew up, I'm, I'm 30, I'm coming 34. So I, the, the Good Friday Agreement was 1998. So I, I, um, I was 98, 87. I was 11 when the Good Friday Agreement was signed. So there was, I, I seen, I was at the back end of the troubles I grew up, but I seen a, a bit of it. And I've seen things that I shouldn't have seen. And, and even after the Troubles, it didn't stop the ratting and, and the fighting in the streets. That still continued for a few years. Still ha still happens, actually, to this day. But um, not as bad as it once was. But, yeah, it was it was, it was was rough enough living there in, in Tigers Bay at that, at that time. I seen... I was... Uh, there was a riot at the bottom of my street um, where a kid, Glenn Branagh, blew, blew himself up. Um, with a pipe bomb trying to throw a pipe bomb short fuse blew the back of his head off I didn't see that happening I saw I did see I remember what I remember about that is seeing a crowd of people around him and seeing his feet sticking out the bottom of this crowd um, and my brother seen it happening my brother was down like at the rat probably ratting 
I remember seeing my brother's face and he was just standing still white, like couldn't believe what he saw. Um, my dad had to pull a guy out of a riot before a former kind of commander, UDA commander in that area. Um, got shot in the head with a rubber bullet, a plastic bullet of the cops. I don't know if you've ever seen these plastic bullets. It sounds like a wee dopey thing, but they're, they look like fucking yeah. candles or big thick things. And they're not allowed to shoot. Apparently they're not meant to shoot you waist above the waist, mm -hmm. but hit him in the head. My dad had to like kind of pull him to safety and um, knows we were a first aid and waited until the ambulance came and he's seen oh, shit like that. Yeah. That, that Do you happened. think then going to the boxing for a younger age kind of kept you away from the troubles? Oh, I know it did. Absolutely. And um, it was like, it was, it was fucking exciting. Like it was really exciting when you're a kid and you grow up in that environment. You see, you just see these rats and it, there was always more ratting in the marching season. So the summer months. So, as a kid, you just you're drawn to that like a fucking a fly to shit <laughs> or whatever you want to describe. You're just drawn to that, and you wanna you wanna be involved and see it, and it's just exciting. So, I was because of boxing. My old trainer Billy McKee, who's I respect him more than any other man in the world. Um, I was always worried. He would he would have went fucking nuts if he knew I was being involved in riots or doing things that I shouldn't have been doing. And I was always worried about how he would react if he found out I was doing things that I shouldn't have been doing. So because of that, that's why I, I just didn't, I didn't really get involved. So you were scared to upset your coach? Scared, scared to upset him because I respected him so much, even more so than my parents. Like my mum and dad wouldn't, wouldn't have liked me to get involved and, and they would have wanted me to stay away from all that stuff. Um, but I was, I was just, more frightened of him finding out. I, yeah. I just have have a, the utmost respect for the man. How was your schooling? I was all right. I, I, I wasn't daft. I think I could have done better in school if I, if I actually applied myself and, <laughs> and put my mind to it, like so many people. But I didn't really care about schooling. Um, never revised for anything ever in my life. Just to show up and came away with a few GCSEs, and, and that's about it, really. Um, I've actually got a fucking. I got an honorary doctorate from Queen's University. Um, and I've got a, literally about three GCSE. So I laughed at my, I laugh at my missus about that because she's very smart. She done. Uh, she got a two one in criminal uh, criminal justice. Very very clever. Just a couple of marks off a of first. Um, and I've done fuck all and, and have a, an honorary doctorate. So yeah. walking about with your your your. Uh, what, the, what was it? Yeah, get the wee, wee folder, fucking, the wee like, folder yeah. the hat and all, yeah. all that, and the big robe. And uh -huh. actually, wore the robe to uh, I fought in Vegas, sir, two fights ago. And I walked out in the robe, got it logoed up, asked Queen's University could I have the robe, uh -huh. and they gave me it. And I got it logoed up and um, with a sponsor and stuff on it, and wore it out to the ring mm -hmm. in my fight against a kid called Taylor McCreary in Vegas. When was your first ever fight? When I, when I was seven, uh, I fought, straight away. Yeah, so I was I was good. Like I was I was dead game, and I was dead competitive. Um, always wanted to win. Whatever I done, football, boxing, fucking rugby. Believe it or not, in school I played as well. Um, and always wanted to win at anything I, I, I tried. But I was seven. I fought in a place, a hotel in Port Stewart, which is up the north coast near Port Rush, and mm -hmm. lovely scenery. And um, I don't remember too much about the fight. And up until you're 11 years old, all the fights are called no decision fights. So they, they don't want kids crying because they lost the fight. Even if you get battered, it's still called a draw at the end. But I, you kind of know when you win. And I, and I won that fight and I just had the buzz for it. It's like, I used to fight in social clubs and stuff a lot. And my uncles used to all go to watch me and um, you'd always get a few quid. So you'd walk around and you'd win a fight and your uncles would be firing you fivers mm -hmm. and you'd come away with maybe 30 quid. And as a seven or eight year old, you feel like a fucking yeah. millionaire. So mm -hmm. Was your was dad a boxer? Because I seen one of your documentaries, I don't know if he was in the gym or you trained at that gym. Yeah, was... my, da my dad helps out in my old amateur club now, mm -hmm. Midland, um, but he wasn't a boxer. My dad done a stint in the army when he was a young man and then I was all way before I was born. Um, but he wasn't, he wasn't a boxer. Um, he just got involved because of me, really. Um, and that was it. But my granda was a big, wasn't a boxer either, but a massive boxing fan. He used to tell me stories about 
there used to be professional fights in the Ulster Hall in Belfast on a Wednesday and a Saturday night so pro fights twice a week um, and he says he used to go to every one of them That's a, I remember him, he telling me a story it's the first time you ever seen a black man was at a pro boxing show and, and you wouldn't see many black men in Belfast in them days and he seen his first black man as an opponent coming in as a fighter so it's mad yeah yeah mental was it um, the ages are between 14, 15 and 16 it must have been a tough time especially if you're trying to not go down to become a pro yeah. but you've still got all the troubles kind of was stopping at that age yeah. how was it, How hard was it to not go down the, the bad route and, stay, and try and stay well, on the good was, path I'd say it was probably I don't know because of boxing I, I, I was always fearful like I said before of, of Billy McKee finding out anything I'd done but I still I got involved in a few rats um not because I was a bad person, just because it was exciting and it was happening at the bottom of my street. So I probably done a few things that I shouldn't have done. I wasn't a bad kid or anything like that, but boxing definitely kept me away from that. Um, I I owe boxing a lot. Like I, you know, I'm happy now. I've got a fucking nice big house. I've got a lovely family, comfortable life, um, and that's all. That's all down down to me being a boxer. Really, boxing saved your life. No, I'm not going to say that. I don't think it's one of them ones where it saved my life or anything. I, I always, I had a good family. You know, my man and dad are good people um, with good morals. Like, they would have always tried to steer me and push me yeah. away from all that stuff You would anyway. have done something positive anyway. Yeah, it wasn't I, think, I think so, probably. I, I thought about, when I hit about 17, I was genuinely thinking about joining the army. I was very close to do that, doing that. Um, but I just stuck a boxing out and... And uh, and that's it, really. A lot of things have kind of fell into place for me, and I think mm. you need a wee bit of luck along the way. Of course, and, but and hard I've, work as well. Hard yeah, work, well, and your, your luck will eventually pop up. Absolutely. I'm not going to deny that. Like, it's been hard getting mm. here, and, and I've put in a lot of effort, but a lot of things have just seemed to have happened and fell in at the right time for me. Yeah. Too. When did you turn pro? I turned pro when I was in 2009, um, 22. Uh, 22 it was so that was do you remember your first pro fight yeah it was in um the olympia in liverpool on a matchroom show eddie hearn actually it wasn't an eddie hearn show fuck me this is how long i've been boxing for barry hearn his dad was a promoter of the show <laughs> um so i was first fight on in a four-rounder against some hungarian who was shit um no one there Fucking maybe my ma, da, a few of my mates um, in the Liver- Liverpool Olympia, which is a fucking shithole. Like, um, I remember thinking, I'd never had pro gloves on my hands before going into this fight. And pro, like, pro gloves are so different than the amateur gloves. The amateur gloves are well padded and soft. And I remember putting the pro gloves on and like just going, holy fuck, what, what are these? These are mental. Like, if you get hit in the head with this, mm-hmm. it's going to hurt. And I remember I got hit in the arm and maybe a couple of glancing shots in the head and it just kind of opened your eyes a bit. Like this pro game is, is pretty it's dangerous. It's a different level from amateur to pro. Just different. It's a different sport, isn't it? Mm-hmm. It's just a, it's a, it's a fucking, it's a hard man sport, like mm-hmm. pro boxing um, compared to amateur mm-hmm. boxing. As a loyalist, but you only fought for Northern, Northern Ireland, but never fought for Britain. No, I didn't. I fought for Ireland. So uh-huh. it, it, like the rugby is, it's uh-huh. an all Ireland sport. Um, so I, I boxed for Ireland. I probably could have f- tried the fight for Britain, GB, but... Did I, it make a difference anyway? But, not, well, uh, so this is the story. Like, I think being an all-Ireland sport, whether you're a Protestant or a Catholic, Loyalist or Republican, if you're from Northern Ireland or the North of Ireland, as some people call it, if you're from that part, you're already going down the South. You're already a couple of points behind. Like, everybody from Northern Ireland... We'll talk to you about like getting their eye wiped, going down south and fighting in the All Ireland Championships. That's just the way it is. Paddy Barnes will tell you, Mick Conlon will tell you. Um, so me being from Northern Ireland and being a prod, it was always hard for me to win fights down there. But it's just the way it was. It was all Ireland. People against you, scored cards, well, like that. They, they say they say they're not, but I'd say they probably were. <laughs> um, but. I probably I never even thought about trying to represent Great Britain. So 
it would have been the exact same scenario. Me being, they'd have just seen me as the fucking Northern Irish guy who's he think he is coming over here to try to win our championships. Mm -hmm. That's what would have happened. I said it would probably been actually worse me trying to do that than represent Great Britain at any major tournaments. What about the Olympics and stuff? I never went to the Olympics. I, I was, there was talk of me boxing in the qualifiers for Beijing in 2008. Um, that's one of the reasons why I turned pro as well. So, the Irish champion at the time was a guy called David Oliver Joyce. Um, and me and him were kind of on the high performance team, but he was the number one and I was the number two. But I was starting to outperform him in the lead up to the Olympic qualifiers and getting better results in all the multi nation events. So they suggested a box off, me and him to box off to see who goes to the qualifiers. His coach was the fucking president of the Irish Boxing Association. So the box off never, never happened. Um, Davey, me and Davey are mates now, by the way, but Davey went to four qualifiers, never qualified for Beijing. And it was kind of like, so I so after that, I boxed him in the All-Irelands and dropped him, fucking give him a stand count and stuff in the last round as well, but dropped him the round before, like beat him up convincingly. And it was always like me sticking my finger up to the IEBA, the Irish Boxing Association, just saying like, fuck you, you should have given me a chance at the Olympics. I'm not going to wait around here for London. I'm just going to go pro, and that's that's mm-hmm. what I've done. How hard is it when you turn pro? How is it difficult? Because I've had a few boxers on that some of them have worked second jobs, some of them have tried to keep their head above water and thought about quitting so much yeah, because there's no funds, there's no backing. It's a, it's a hard game, yeah, it really is. And I, um, I owe my family a lot. Like, my mum and dad, like, helped fund me. You're not earning much at the very start. My wife uh, literally lived off her student loan as well at the very start. Um, so I owe her a hell of a lot too. But yeah, it's, it's, it's hard. People think professional boxers, like you start up like a professional footballer, they're earning, they're earning dough. Mm-hmm. Professional, any dickhead could be a professional boxer if you can hold your hands up. Like, it doesn't mean you're good <laughs> to be a prof- Honestly, it doesn't mean you're good. Like, there's white collar yeah. guys could turn pro. Mm-hmm. Um, but being being a good professional boxer is a bit different than just being a professional boxer yeah. and it, it takes a while before you start earning mm-hmm. you're very dedicated to your craft though your work ethic i've seen your training videos and mm. you seem to go in camp a bit longer than other people why is that i do i've i've always done it so i was with the mcguigans before um and that was something that they always you know for 12 round fights 12 week camps is something that they thought was good barry mcguigan always trained long and he always had big camps and he was always like trained like notoriously hard he's well known for his work ethic um back when he was fighting so it was something i i always done even with them i continue to do it now when i'm with jamie moore even though jamie's telling me i don't need i don't need 12 weeks eight weeks is enough as long as you're ticking over at home but because i've always done it Mm -hmm. i always i always do 12 weeks it's worked for you though it's worked for me and i just keep doing it but i I think the intensity's changed like Mm -hmm. With the McGuigans previously, it was fucking every session, like, like balls to the wall, like, always fucked. What always. is a normal session like for you in camp? Well, it depends. It depends what stage of the camp you're at. Like, as the fight gets a bit closer, the, the intensity increases. But today, like, I'm getting ra- I'm sparring tomorrow. So I had a really easy day today, just getting in preparation for the sparring. But when I was with the McGuigans, I, I don't ever remember having an easy day. <laughs> so it was balls deep today. Yeah spar tomorrow uh, and then your second session tomorrow mm-hmm. after the spar would be another killer as you get older do you train harder or do you t- because you are getting older or do you take the foot off the gas about and rest more no i train smarter and and i don't i train i listen to my body more now and you you look at guys like bernard hopkins prime example done very little sparring as he got older like he won a fucking world title when he was 40 odd and he's 40, 50 yeah. Fuck, 50 yeah, he won a world title yeah. didn't he? um but he, he reduced the rounds of sparring because it's just he knows how to fight. It's just it's mm-hmm. just wear and tear on the body. Joe Calzaghe didn't spar very much either. These are these are great. Yeah, I heard you know that I mean? because his hands or something. His hands were fucked. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but like he knows how to fight. Yeah, so he doesn't need to spar. He can, he just he just. I'd imagine Mayweather didn't spar that much either because he doesn't get hit. He no, I don't, I don't think. I think he I think he done more than them, but mm-hmm. I don't think he probably reduced it. He used to do mad stuff like he was super fit. Like he used to do like not half rounds like one thirty minute fucking spar mm-hmm. um but 
he had this persona as if he was a party boy and, and he used to go to the parties and the yeah. clubs but he didn't drink didn't touch mm-hmm. drugs trained like fuck mm-hmm. like he'd come back from a fucking nightclub and go for Start a run, run. see I, I think that's all mind fucking everybody because yeah. I think two days before a fight used to hold a burger and stuff and pretending it was eating that or mm-hmm. eating that but it was there was some method behind it even when he, he was doing his training for like Sky Sports he used yeah. to fuck about on the pads Yeah, but I'd imagine once the cameras were off it, would, it was it ruthless he, he, he gets a bit of grief about people think that he's daft but he's got to be one of the smartest boxers in the world like he's yeah. fucking stinking rich he's played the game he's played everybody every opponent he's ever had he's just messed why do you think he is hated though um, because of the money because stuff, he wasn't it? it in people's faces yeah, kind of yeah and he throws yeah. the money about no yeah. he's calmed down he's, he's, he's tamed it a bit in his mm-hmm. old age but um, he's he is the fighter of of my generation like yeah. Floyd Mayweather one of the best of all time who did what about Steve Collins and stuff another Ivy's great two weight world champion yeah. did, how does the support you get when you start winning world title fights how does everybody come together in well, Ireland St- Steve's always been someone who's supported me and I've seen him in a few events and he always wishes me well and he's a nice guy his um, his brother Roddy Collins actually played for the football team I support so Crusaders semi pro team you've probably never heard of him never they're um, like the top earners 500 quid a week and this, but it's it's fucking still real football they're allowed to tackle mm-hmm. in, the, in the Irish League still <laughs> yeah. but Roddy Collins came and this was during the Troubles so he came from Dublin and played for Crusaders like a, a prod team um, and they're, they're just they're good people they've, they've always backed me was that a Catholic like, going to play for a prod team? I was a team? Catholic going Did to play for a prod team slaughtered? no I, well he, from opposing fans he might have got a bit of grief but he was he was well respected and still is mm-hmm. um, in Crusaders yeah when you won your European title fight, mm. how was that feeling? That was big for me because it was a it was a hard hard fight. I, I beat Kiko Martinez. I think it was my. I was talking about this recently. It was my 16th fight. Because you were 16 and 0 at that point, huh? Yeah, but I was, I was meant to fight. I was meant to fight Kiko originally for the European title in my 11th fight, but he had to pull out. He had family issues and. Um, I think his dad had his, his leg amputated, which obviously your fucking man's not right. Yeah. So he pulled out and he was right to do that. But me fighting Kiko, I'd, in my, my 11th fight, I may have been a wee bit too great. And that's what I'm talking about, these things that kind of fall into place. Like he, him pulling out might have been a touch lucky for me. You know what I mean? Yeah. Because it would have been a fucking hard and difficult mm-hmm. fight for me in my, only my 11th fight because I fought him five fights later on the 16th and it was hard. And I was a more experienced guy. I had a few longer fights and more rounds under my belt. So, like, I, f- I was. I remember everybody saying he'll slow down after four rounds. Like, just be ready for a, an onslaught for four rounds and he'll slow down. I remember coming out for the eighth, going, When the fuck's he slowing down? He hasn't slowed down yet. Like, yeah. I was pissing blood after the fight. I knocked him out in the ninth round and I just, I was laying on the ropes when he was down. I was just wishing, like, fuck don't get up don't get up <laughs> and he wasn't able to get up so. yeah how, how many times do you push blood after a fight is that frequently um, I hear boxers no, speak about that all the time no I, I, that's that's the only time that's happened to me um, but y- you hear about it all the time when people are taking beatings and stuff um, I took I took a fucking worse beating in the Warrington fight but I, w- I wasn't pushing blood yeah. after that one that's crazy isn't it yeah when did you get the Santa Cruz fight was that your, in your 20, 20, 21st 22nd fight world 22nd title? 22nd 23rd I was 22 and all going in there fight, so because your two fight. world title fights that you've won is mm. you beat undefeated fighters yeah. I think you beat four or five undefeated f- fighters yeah I've beat, I've beat a few and I've done mm. it the hard way and that's that's why like this this third world t- like I haven't I haven't beat anyone for vacant titles I've always mm. beat champions Kiko yeah. Martinez although he had a few defeats he was a champion on a run when I beat him then I fought Quig to unify that division he was undefeated at the time a champion beat him Santa Cruz undefeated on a champion beat him mm-hmm. um, and Jamel Herring to do it for a third weight world title he's not undefeated but he's a fucking champion yeah. and a good fighter because I seen he's a because I seen I don't know what fight it was I don't know if you were in Vegas and he was standing next to you yeah. Herring oh he's Jan what is it 5'10 5'11 5'10 with Jan compared to me like. but again then you look at Canelo and Smith fight it doesn't I fucking know. mean anything I, it doesn't I, it's something that excites me like mm-hmm. I, I fought bigger guys bigger than me my whole career so it doesn't it doesn't bother me at all and and i you know i i think i can use that to my advantage like 
it's not easy for me to get down to nine stone four and I'm five foot five. He's got to be killing himself to make nine stone four. He says he's not, but he's. I, I just think he's. So you'd be faster then. You must be faster. Well, he's fatter. got all. I think all he's got on me is reach, is reach and his physicality and his size. He's just a big specimen. Mm -hmm. I feel like my feet are better. I punch faster. I punch harder. Um, my distance controls better. I feel like I'm the better fighter, but his size is going to be the, the big mm -hmm. obstacle. Well, you've got something then to truly go for. Like you've no, won a world title, two world titles. This is this puts you the all time greatest, basically, it, if you won three in three different divisions. I've got, I've got the bit between my teeth. I genuinely, I've never been up for a fight as much as this in my life mm -hmm. because I talk about legacy and stuff all the time. And this is this is the one that cements the legacy three weight world champion this you know people i don't want to be a flash in the pan and i want people to be talking about me in the pubs in 30 years time still and the boy saying i was at frampton's fight when he fucking beat santa cruz mm -hmm. or jamel hurrying or quig i i don't know if that's me being a wee bit fucking vain or what but you've that's, got to that's be man to be the elite to be to win three weight world titles you've got to be to even win one never yeah. mind two or three is is a totally different ball game mm. So no doubt you have all the backing because you're loved in Belfast. Are you, are you loved all over Ireland because yeah. of the success you've brought? I'm, w I'm well supported and that, that's something that one of the biggest things that uh, that brings me most pride, like the fan base. And um, there hasn't been, there really hasn't been a fighter since McGuigan mm -hmm. that had the fan base from back home that I have. Like I um, brought... You know, the, when I fought Kegel from a first world title, they, they built the fucking stadium for me, like a purpose-built stadium, temporary stadium in Belfast. I filled Windsor Park for a fight as well. I brought 5,000 people to Vegas mm -hmm. in January, so just after Christmas when people are skint. Like there's, Ricky Hatton was an extreme. He brought 25,000 yeah. to Vegas when mm -hmm. he fought Mayweather. But I brought 5,000. I don't think... The only two fighters at this point in time who could bring from the UK who bring five thousand fans to Vegas is AJ and Fury, Fury. and I've done that. Like mm -hmm. so, that's that's something I'm very very proud yeah, of. You should be, but the Irish support, you know, any any Irish personality that's quite high up in any sport, they back you to the hill. They, I know. The Irish always have and always will. It's like when you see Conor McGregor and shit fighting as well. The the people that they take with them is. Love them. It's unbelievable. Yeah. It's Why a, is that? Is it just because it's fighting? No, they're just, no, they're just very passionate. It's a, bit, it's a bit like, I think we're very similar to the Scottish. Like, yeah. we're similar personalities. Mm -hmm. um, I think uh, I think they're just passionate and they get, they get behind you as long as you're not a, a dickhead. And, yeah. Well, and I was going to say arrogant or above yourself. I'm saying fucking McGregor is, but he's just a, he's a, an enigma. Superstar, like, he's a superstar. Yeah. But for the most people, being from Belfast... They'll support you if you're doing well and winning. And even if you're not winning, but you're doing well, as long as you don't get above your station. Like, we, we don't like, we don't like fucking show off some Belfast. Yeah, like Mayweather style of fucking he, he money wouldn't, on. He yeah, wouldn't yeah, fucking yeah. sell a ticket. <laughs> if he's from Belfast, no one like yeah. him. I mean, he's the best in the world. Yeah. Like, but when you got your world title shot then, how was that feeling against Santa Cruz? Um, That was unreal. That was, I just beat Quig, um, the Unify the super bantamweight division so I went into the fight did you beat Quig first for the world title yeah I beat Quig or was he first I thought Santa Cruz was no, first no Quig was before Santa Cruz because he said that was a battle of Britain yeah you went to right. was it Manchester Manchester mm -hmm. fought him he's, I watched the face off it was, his, knows? Uh, it, was it was like the build up to the Quig fight was he's look, he's genuinely looked as if he's didn't fucking nah, like each other didn't. there was a wee bit of bit of needle but um, again you know we, when you fight someone I think you get, mm -hmm. gain a respect for them after mm -hmm. it but because both of you were undefeated. Undefeated, yeah. Mm -hmm. I'd always fancied the Quig fight. He was British champion when I was kind of coming up and I always wanted to fight him for the British title. Um, but he never would. And I fought a guy called Alejandro Gonzalez in Texas um, who I was meant to blow away. Everyone, everyone thought it was going to be easy. But this kid dropped me twice in the first round. Um and that's the only reason why Quig wanted to fight me. Like, he never wanted anything to do with me. And then he seen this kid put me down. He thought, I'll fucking destroy Frampton now. So that was kind of a blessing. Like, again, falling into place, blessing mm -hmm. in disguise for me. Same reason for why Santa Cruz wanted to fight me, because he never showed any interest before. And 
because of the fight, me getting dropped, he wanted to fight me. So I beat Quig and Santa Cruz, I think, because, off the back yeah. of me getting dropped. Because you and the Quig fight was, a, was like five years in the making. Yeah, it, it, it should have happened a long time before, but I'm mm. kind of glad it, it, yeah. it took so long because it was for world titles. Mm. And Because you came out of the traps flying, first six rounds, seven but rounds. It was it was an easy fight. It was the strangest tactics in the world from them. I was like, I was... I was dead at the weight, like eight stone ten. I was I was making then, and I was fucked doing the weight. And he, I don't know. I I'd won the first six rounds by doing fuck all. Like I was, it was easy. Like I remember going back to the corner and sitting down and speaking to Shane McGuigan, and he's saying, "Look, you're fucking winning the rounds. You don't have to like overdo it. Just conserve your energy. If this is easy, just let it be easy." strange tactics from Emmons he didn't start the second half of the fight and then it was already too far gone but that was that was one of my easiest fights I've ever had I but, think but again it was a split decision how are you feeling when he got one of his scorecards that, so that was I remember but you must have been shitting yourself because going, it was in his back garden fuck? I know what's going on here couldn't couldn't believe it one of them give it to him 115 113 so two rounds there's no way he could score a fight this got quick. Mm -hmm. No doubt in my fucking mind. Like, I, I don't understand how that's happened. And people talk about backhanders in this game and all. I don't I don't know, but it was a strange one. <laughs> um, and then the other two saw correctly and gave mm -hmm. it to me. Is that a lot of that happened, though? Scorecards getting fixed for well, big I don't, fights? I don't know if they're, like, fixed. You know, we you go back to, like, the 50s and the 60s and... Mm -hmm fights were fixed like the mob in america were involved in fights and, and match fixing and telling people to take a day the famous one ali and sonny liston that was meant to be mob involvement mm -hmm. and but there's just i don't know if it's still going on now nah. i look at the tyson fury and wilder fight yeah. tyson fury fucked him up of course he did and it, and then how that became a he draw I, there's too much money involved you think well there, there's so much money involved isn't there and and whether that's there's dodgy stuff going on behind the background, I don't know. Or a lot of time it can just be incompetent fucking judging. How do well. you think the rules should change? I think you should have more judges or do you think there should be different I don't know. things put in place? I, I really don't know. I think but I think when someone gives a scorecard that's so so wrong, I think then you should either be given a warning if you do it again, yeah. you're never allowed to mm -hmm. be involved in boxing. Never mind mm -hmm. a big fight, just fucking boxing. Yeah. Like get rid of them because it could ruin someone's career mm -hmm. right down at the bottom. Because it, as well, it, would it not be good to get like the scorecards each round? So yeah. if you know if you're a winning or you're ahead, so you know you can put more in. Yeah, I know. three because boxers have used took to, their foot off the gas for the last two rounds and have been beat. They used to do it in the amateurs. Um, give you scorecards in between the rounds and you kind of knew and then they stopped doing that as well so because Olympics used to get points for hitting yeah yeah, and yeah. you've got a rough idea oh, it's, it's, and that's changed again that's mm -hmm. kind of more towards a professional but that's yeah. it's uh, I don't know there's there's arguments for all different reasons mm -hmm. to change things and change the scoring but it's something that needs looked at because I think I think that scoring has been it's been got pretty bad and, and Britain is turning to be fucking Britain's like <laughs> Some yeah. of the scorecards in Britain <laughs> yeah. is bad. Like it used to be, last year was terrible. It used to be Germany. Yeah. Like a fighter would never go to Germany because mm -hmm. they know you're going to get robbed. But if I was a foreign fighter, I'd be thinking, I don't want to go to fucking the UK. Like yeah. there's no chance of me winning. Mm -hmm. So how was the relationship with Quig after that fight? You seem to have got on no too yeah, bad. Yeah, he's, he's all right. Quig's a strange one because I I don't mind him. He's a, he's, he's a bit dim. Like a, <laughs> he's fucking he's a bit daft. But it's like... Anytime I see him, we'd always say hello, but I was in Boston, my mate was fighting, Tommy Coyle in Boston, and I was over watching him. And I walked into the hotel and Quig was already there because he was, was he on the bill or was he over watching? Anyway, he was there. And he's, every time I see him for the first time, he kind of growls at you a bit, like and snarls and looks at you and tries to stir you out until you say, well, Scott, how you doing? And then he'd shake your hand. But it's like- Awkward. He, it's just fucking weird. There's no need for it. Everyone else is nice. You know, we had a yeah. fight. It was a few years ago uh -huh. now. Like, just forget about Still it. Still holding a grudge, you think? I don't know. It's weird. Yeah. It's strange. Well, so after the Santa Cruz fight, you won the world title. Yeah. Second weight. Yeah. World title. How was that feeling? That, that was massive. That was... Uh, was that a lot was of huge. pressure on you? No, there wasn't because he was a big favourite going into the fight. So there wasn't loads of pressure, if I'm being honest. Um, i just unified the division before going to New York. I think there was 35 American journalists asked who's going to win the fight and 34 picked Santa Cruz. So they all thought he was going to win the fight. 
Did you heal this before the, the I, fight? I kind of knew about How that. Does that, does that's that all right. It just, fuel you? Yeah, there's just no no pressure. It's, mm-hmm. I think it's better to be in that situation as the mm-hmm. underdog. Why do you think you're so much an underdog, especially getting in 22 and 0? Because of the... Well, Santa Cruz was one of the biggest names in boxing at that stage. He was probably top 10, pound for pound, in the world. Two fights before it, I'd just been dropped by that Alejandro Gonzalez kid. Um that's that's the reasons really i was in america as well i was the foreign fighter um yeah that's that's probably why so it, it kind of was a weight off my shoulders always fighting at home always being the favorite you just there's more pressure in them mm-hmm. situations i think how was it in the rematch to your first defeat i was hot it was bad it was hard to take santa cruz was good that fight yeah he was I? very good and he and he he out thought me and it's something that still annoys me because we never changed tactics in the fight and, and even the instructions I got in the corner I don't think were great and I'm not I, you know I, I'll hold responsibility and say that I was the fighter I lost the fight and I did but you know we just need to work together better as a team the instructions weren't great I think Shane McGuigan actually maybe says that he wasn't on it as he had been previously and we thought that Leo was just going to... Like, he applies a lot of pressure, throws a lot of punches, so I thought that he's just going to do more of the same this time. But he just kept things longer, and he was much better, and, mm-hmm. and outfought me in the second fight. It was not a good fight, but he uh, he won it. Can you get into a fight too confident? Yeah, absolutely. I, I went into the fight um, against Josh Warrington with knowing it's going to be a, a hard fight. Like, a, I knew he was fit, and he was tough, and I knew, like... It's going to be a long, long fight, like a 12-round hard fight. I'm going to be tired after this. But I never expected him to be able to hurt me. Yeah. Like, nothing in his record suggests that he's a puncher. If he's, he hurt me more than I've ever been hurt in a yeah, fight before. because he came out the traps flying. He rocked you the first yeah. round. I've had Josh on. To be fair, I love Josh to bits, man. He's, he seems to be he's a good tough guy. as nails, man. And his backstory as well from working, still working even when he turned yeah. pro and to kick on and... I think he's one of the most underrated. I don't know why he's not he's, as big as what he is. Massively underrated. Massively underrated. And he's one of the most exciting styles in, in yeah. Britain. But and me and him have a great respect for each other. Um, he's fighting this Kanzu, I think. Yeah. Chinese fella who throws mm. as many punches as him. I can't wait to see that mm-hmm. fight. I think it's going to be a cracker. But I fancy Josh to win it. And um, he just... I just, I, It's something that annoys me that I went into that fight thinking... He can't hurt me. Mm-hmm. Fuck, he hurt me inside a fucking minute. Yeah, he like, came out flying. Flying, yeah. And yeah. He, like he, he hurt me a number of times in that fight. It's just fuck. so. How? Why is he not getting the? He's loved in Leeds, and I think his his career will grow as well. As yeah. I think his majority of his fights, he's been underrated. Do you mm-hmm. ever feel when you were fighting Santa Cruz and you had the 33 to 35 for the reporter saying? Do you think that's where the mentality of I'll fucking show those people. Who... And maybe it is, but I don't. But I don't know. Like Josh beat Lee Selby, brilliant win. He mm-hmm. beat me, brilliant win. Um, he's now getting ready to unify the title, and I hope he goes on and, and does it. Maybe that's when people will give him the respect he deserves because he does deserve it. Yeah, he's done it. Like he's done it. I'd say when he turned pro, and I don't know what he really wanted to do when he started pro. Did he ever believe he was going to be a world champion? I'm not sure because. He wasn't from a great amateur background or anything. He done it like he won area titles, English titles. He, like he went right up through the fucking ranks, yeah. and he's beat me, Lee Selby, a few other top names, and and he's about to unify the division. Did you ever so, get a rematch with Josh? I'd I'd love it, you know, at, you? at some point. Mm-hmm. And I, I like being involved. Like I always wanted to be involved in a fight like the Warrington fight, like a, a fucking war, like Morales Barrera. Mm-hmm. But I'd, I'd have liked to have won it as well. Like, you know what I mean? But <laughs> it's uh, or something, you get a fucking real feeling. I don't know. You just feel, you feel like a hard fucker for even, even the fact that he didn't drop me. Like, he was close to dropping me a few mm-hmm. times. And the fact that I was able to stay up. I that get a shows week, you your character. Well, I get a bit of satisfaction mm-hmm. out of that. You know what I mean? Yeah, I, I always say it, but boxers are a bit fucked up. <laughs> yeah, no, it's not. It's How not. is it for like, your wife to watch? How, uh, she, after the Warrington fight, she's promised that she'll never go back to watch me fight in the game. Did they get scared? I, I watched her sitting ringside and the first time I watched the Warrington fight back, um, I watched, I could see she was sitting in the front row. I watched her more than I watched the fight. Mm-hmm. She, she was fucking, you know, her head turning and her covering her eyes and 
she just said, I, I can't I can't put myself through that again. And I completely understand that. Even if she did want to go, she's the type of person, like she's very stubborn. If she did want to go to any fights, any future fights, because she's already said she's not going, she'll I know she'll not yeah. go. Has she ever told you right enough's enough? She'd have loved me to retire after a big Kiko Martinez for mm-hmm. the fucking world title in two thousand and was that fourteen? Um, <laughs> yeah, she just she just, just looking after you basically. Yeah, yeah. And mm-hmm. she's she's a, a good girl. Like she really yeah. I should listen to her a bit more. Not about retiring, but in other things like <laughs> in other things. Yeah. She's always got my best interest at heart. Yeah. Like I, I see fucking people. I think everyone's my best mate. If someone shows me a bit of interest, I think this guy's all right, but they're all a lot of people are looking they're running for different things. Everybody's agendas, got an really. agenda. Everybody's mate. Yeah, looking something. Yeah. But I know that when the shit does hit the fan, it's yeah. always your missus or your family that's told there to so. say, told you so. Like my, my ma and dad would never get involved in anything like that for mm-hmm. me. My dad, like I, my dad's my best mate, but he just stares out of all that stuff. Mm-hmm. But Christine is one of the most honest people I know and she'd always keep me right. But she or somewhere like I trust everybody. She doesn't fucking trust anybody. <laughs> so I think if somewhere uh, in the middle, probably yeah, the right that was bonds. a teamwork then, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. So if you it must be difficult because if you've put twenty years over twenty years into your craft and you start hitting world title fights, obviously then money comes in more. So you want to secure not just your own future but your kids, your, yeah. their kids. It's difficult because now you know that every big fight you're getting is going to be a big plus for you. Yeah, and that, look, you want to obviously boxing, boxing. People talk about the belts and, and everything else. Legacy is very, very important to me. But obviously having a secure life for, for my kids and hopefully earning enough money that my kids are comfortable when I'm gone and dead and buried and potentially even their kids have a few quid out the back of mm-hmm. it. You know what I mean? If, mm-hmm. if they invest money correctly and do the right thing. So I'm, uh, I, I came from a family who had nothing um, and I'm in a different position now where, where I have some money and... Hopefully, we'll be able to use it wisely, and my kids will, will benefit from that too. They must be proud of you. Your dad must be buzzing. My, my dad's. Or like, does he show much? He love? does never, never. <laughs> <laughs> He's like an old Just school, that old school tough man. Like, I imagine the same yeah. as fucking Glasgow yeah. parents. Like they don't. Mm-hmm. Like, I've never. I don't think I've ever uh, hugged my dad ever. I don't remember. I'm sure he did hug me when I was a baby, mm-hmm. but I don't remember him hu- ever hugging me. I actually remember my ma when I went to fight Kiko for my first world title. I was just about to get to the ring and she fucking walked out in front of me and like with her arms wide about to give me a hug. And I'm like, why the f- you've never hugged me. I don't ever remember you hugging me. Why the fuck are you doing it now on TV? Mm-hmm. I'm about to go on f- the biggest mm-hmm. fight of my life. I remember thinking, see if I lose this fight, she's getting blamed for hugging mm-hmm. me. But, Jinx, aye, but it um, uh, it worked out. It worked out in the end. Where does the nickname the Jackal come from? Um, my mate called me it. Carlos was my nickname. Why you called Carl? So Carlos. Oh and fuck. Roberto Carlos was yeah, fucking yeah. in his pump at the time. Um, I'm not comparing myself to Roberto Will Carlos. You play left back, but it was all right. I used to play defender, mm-hmm. centre midfielder, left or right back, and there was uh, I was all right at football, and I used to get stuck in. But I wasn't like Roberto Carlos. It was all right, like. But mm-hmm. so I could call Carlos anyway. And then Carlos the Jackal is a fucking infamous Colombian terrorist. I think um, my mate called me Carlos the Jackal, and then he used to just call, he was the only one in school. A guy called Mark Adamson he used to call me Jackal. Um, no one else did. And then when I had to think of a nickname, boxing nickname, McGuigan actually asked me what would what nickname do you want and I suggested Jackal and he thought it was good and, and that was it just stuck mm-hmm. how is the relationship with the McGuigans now oh it's dead is it fucked now no, there's, there's no relationship mm-hmm. I'm just out of a court case with him um, which was settled um, it was just so it was settled so no one can say they won or anything mm-hmm. but what I can say is I'm very fucking happy with the settlement yeah. I can say that so um, but there's no relationship I fucking despise them all them hate them and um just just the way it is it's sad that, that, it is always, sad. that always happens though with boxers happen and boxing. trainers and but when it comes to money and fucking this, people just why is that but again I, look i like to think of myself as a nice guy and i mm-hmm. trust everybody and like i love these guys like i had shane and jake mcguigan as groomsmen at my wedding i was a groomsman at shane's wedding but so like brothers basically yeah yeah pretty much um 
but I have a deep hatred for them now and all of them and I wouldn't fucking piss on them if they're on fire I genuinely mean I'd hate them how was that then to start a new camp with different trainers um, does that give you a new lease of life though or it, is it hard to get it, different I, tactics I think it did but I think um, so when I, when I left the McGuigans and I had no one for maybe two months and I was thinking about what trainer I was going to use my dad actually suggested Jimmy Moore. Like, I hadn't even thought about Jimmy Moore because at the time he was only training Tommy Coyle, who mm. was his one fighter. Um, I had thought of... I had, Adam Booth was in my head as one of them. He's um, a great trainer. Great trainer. Um, who else? Pete Taylor, who's Katie Taylor's dad. Yeah. And Ishmael Salas, who trained David Hay and stuff for a while. They were the three guys that was in my head. My dad suggested Jimmy Moore, and I went, that's a fucking good shout. I was in, I was in Vegas for Mayweather McGregor, and I phoned Jimmy and said, look, you'd be interested in training me. And I went there thinking, I'll do a week with him, I'll do a week with Booth, do a week with yeah. Taylor and a week with Salas and see who, who fits like best. Like a trial. But I just trained with Jimmy, and I just said, I'm happy here. I like, mm-hmm. I, like, I like what they're talking about. I like the direction they want me to go or like the things they're saying and they're fucking good people and I'm genuinely delighted that I made yeah. that move because they're I I never enjoyed boxing when I was with the McGuigans like I there's interviews of me talking about retiring like I can't wait till I'm 30 because I'm going to fucking retire I hate this game was it the training that was hard? just training too hard like for, for the quick fight I'd done 220 rounds of sparring I used to spar welterweights and light middleweights have these gym wars and just be fucked all the time but, but then would you have won those titles if you didn't well, do I know, that? But I, I think when when you're younger, you can get away with that. Mm-hmm. But as you get older, you can't you can't do that anymore. Like Barry McGuigan retired when he was 28 nine, or yeah. nine, 29. Um, and he talks about, like he, he's spoken to me about how hard he trained. And he, put, himself out, and he puts it down to being burnt out mm-hmm. at a young age. Like 29 is a young age yeah, to that's, retire that's as a fighter. That's prime, I believe. Uh. Yeah, so he... He knows because he, he thinks he burnt himself out, but the training for me was similar to, to what mm-hmm. he was doing. So it was yeah. a bit contradictory, a, a wee mm-hmm. bit, but um, look, what they were, Barry's a very knowledgeable boxing person. Like he knows fucking boxing inside out. Um, Shane is a very good trainer as well, I believe. And I've, I've openly said that, but um, you know, I'll, I'll always be honest and I'll say that they're, they're very good boxing people but I just I just don't like them just other politics side yeah, this one. Just don't yeah. like them at all. but look what you're doing now you've got another world title fight coming up how was it fighting in your hometown Windsor Park unreal I've always wanted to do that that's some well not always but when I started to get started when did to, you start thinking right I can sell this out here so when I started to do the Odyssey and I was selling out the Odyssey which is 9,000 but I was selling it out in fucking a week and a half mm-hmm. um, I fought Kiko outdoor in a purpose-built stadium 16,000 that held sold that out quickly um so I started to think I started to think around that time I started to do the odyssey quickly I started to think I could do Windsor here I think I could against the right opponent so I'm a big Northern Ireland football fan so I was thinking everybody that supports Northern Ireland the football team will want to go to my fight just because it's Windsor Park Mm -hmm. plus I've got a fan base of myself that don't support Northern Ireland will want to go so we'll sell it out definitely but it was a long time coming like um, and after I left McGuigan I spoke to a few different promoters Eddie Hearn and Warren were the two that was kind of thinking about who do I go with here I ended up going with Frank Warren and the question I asked both of them is can you deliver me a fight at Windsor Park both of them said yes but it was it was worn to choose to just the goods. Yeah. How about they two hate each other as well, don't they? I don't think they like each other much. Uh, yeah. Because I've had the uh, big Tony Bell on, and he hates Frank. He he hates Frank. Yeah. Right. Uh, How about, is that, so? You're not even just politics with your trainers. You've got politics with your promoters and managers. It's, it's is mad. it that difficult? No, it's, it's instead it's, of just you just want to fight. Basically, boxing's a fucking such a dirty business, man. Mm-hmm. And people talk to me about what do I want to do after and maybe managing fighters or coaching I I, I know now for a fact I'll never manage or coach a fighter <laughs> just because there's too much yeah. bullshit and yeah. politics involved um, if I 
I like to do a wee bit of punditry. I'm starting to do a wee bit more mm-hmm. of that with Sky and BT. Mm-hmm. And you've got an own, your own podcast, which we'll plug. Yeah. It's obviously on a break now because you're it's training. On a break. It's What's coming it called? Back. Um, well, we don't know. We don't have a new oh, name for this one yet. You've changed it, yeah. So it used to be TKO, so we don't have a new name uh-huh. for the new one. Inside Fighting. Actually, we do have a name. Fuck yeah. me, I don't even know. <laughs> In, inside Fighting is what you call it. So um, me and Chris Lloyd, um, I've got a wee fucking YouTube channel that has mm. fuck off. What's the name of it? YouTube channel? Yeah. Um, I think just Carl Frampton. I don't know. Yeah. Carl Frampton. We'll leave a link in the description anyway for people to tune in. It's I've got two and a half thousand subscribers, yeah. but I feel like a content deserves more. It takes time. It doesn't even mean. See, do you know what? Subscribers mean fuck all. Yeah, it's, it's all you, about content it? and yeah, just yeah. what's the content there. Now you know the names and all the the, the people to get in to then just build it. it takes time well I'm looking forward to the podcast because the last one um, TKO with me and Chris done we had some great names on it mm. who'd you have on um, we had fucking Kurt Angle yeah um, the wrestler was a brilliant one that was my, that was my favourite one with our first first ever one we done was Chris Eubank Senior mm-hmm. and how's Chris I, he, I, I think he's alright but I yeah. didn't I spoke to him for an hour and didn't know what the fuck he was talking about. <laughs> and I sat there thinking, like, is every show yeah. going to be like this? I, I can't do this. And um, we had Jamie Carragher, um, David Hay. Great guest, we've had We've had some some big names. And, and I think it's going to be a wee bit different, this next one. Obviously, it's, it's a boxing podcast, but mm-hmm. we're going to get other guys in with different ideas of who we want to get in. And uh, we'll maybe get you on as well. Oh, come day. on, man. Not but a problem, yeah. I think... Chris, who I do it with, is... He's a nice guy. He's, he's a nice guy. Earlier. Very, very knowledgeable. Especially about boxing. He does all the research. For me, it's the easiest job in the world because I'm mm-hmm. just saying... I just I just fucking butt in every yeah. now and again. So I don't even have to do any research. Mm-hmm. Chris does it all. Is that what you want to do? Like present and stuff? Like Sky like, Sports after I like, this? I like the punditry for... You know, I've worked with BT and, and Sky a bit and I, th- I keep getting offered more fights now than, than I used to. Mm-hmm. I think they know, you know, I'm at the end of my career you maybe start to do a bit more of this. I've done stuff for Radio 5 Live and stuff. And yeah, yeah I've got a fight here this weekend, actually. Fucking my mate is fighting the big Thor, you know, out of Game of Thrones, the yeah, giant. Yeah, yeah. Stevie Ward is fighting him. It's like a fucking three, three threes mm-hmm. YouTube fucking fight. But they're mega. Oh, like they, these YouTubers now are getting slaughtered, oh, but they're making millions. I take my hat off to them, but some of them can, some of them can scrap. Some of them can fight a bit, though, definitely. I find that a bit cheesy. I think it, it can ruin. Boxing's a, an art, it's a craft. Yeah. But again, if it's drawn in wider audiences, because the way the thing's going, how are you finding it as well with no fans? Ah, it's grim. It's, I, my, I was, I thought, I was lucky enough to fight in August, so a lot of people haven't fought while COVID has been happening. So boxing shows have been cancelled everywhere. So I was lucky enough to fight and got a payday. I fought a kid from Aberdeen, actually, Darren Trainer, And I was just... That was a good fight. It wasn't a bad fight. It was, Darren's like a couple of levels below so me. but it was, though? No, no, I think he was a few, few defeats. Was he? Right, Who but, was the boy you fought not so long ago? It was undefeated, the young boy. Oh, you know, black guy in America. Yeah. That's Taylor McCreary. Was that in Vegas? He yeah, was, was good, man. He wasn't bad, yeah. but I, I fucking broke both hands. Well, actually, my left hand was broke going into that fight. And then I broke my right hand about the seventh round, so two broken hands in that fight. Um, do you feel that? Oh, I, felt that my, a, I couldn't. I couldn't throw my left hand. After that? I hardly done anything. With do my you left know hand. if somebody's broke their hand? Would you know? Um, you might have a feeling, like you might know if he stops throwing it as much. But mm-hmm. um, like I done well to win that fight so clearly with two broken hands. Um, but I fought this darn trainer fella in your call, no crowd. It's hard to get out of second gear, man. It's just oh, like, oh, it was just, it was like a spar. It was shit. Yeah. That must be difficult. It's a weird time, but hopefully fans and that can get hopefully, moved hopefully back Hopefully we'll in. fans in soon. Mm-hmm. But so, I, think a, I think a lot of it was to do with the level of opposition too. Mm-hmm. Not to discredit him, but my next fight will probably be with no fans, but mm-hmm. it's for a world title against a great fighter. So I think I'll be a bit more switched yeah. on. You're on the, how are you feeling now? You're, you're looking sharp. You're, no, you're on. I'm, I'm, I'm about... I got weighed the other day. I was 10 stone two. The fight's at 9 four, so I'm under a stone over, which is sounds a fair bit, but it's not really for a boxer. Mm-hmm. So um, I'm where I need to be. I'm fit. My lungs are good. Uh, I'm sharp enough in sparring. So I'm just starting to ramp up things up. How long has this been fight getting planned for? Because you've been speaking about uh, this for two or three years now. I've been talking about this f- since 
probably 2018 no about 19 so yeah. summer well but they started the initially talk about it after the warrington defeat so early 2019 then the plan was like go to super featherweight jamel herring's the one we want to target um and that's that's it's been talked about but we, the fight like has actually been really talked about for about a year where mm. we probably because of covid we would have already fought if this hadn't have happened but it is what it is. Do you ever doubt yourself when you got your second defeat? Did you think, this is it, I, I need to take a foot off or did well, you just want to keep going? After warning them, I, in, in my head, I was retired for for about two or three weeks. Like I was a retired fighter. I hadn't made an announcement, but I was like, I don't want to do this anymore. And then I just thought about it and thought about it rationally, sat down with my wife and sat down with my team and just said, like, that wasn't me you know i've had a great career it would be shit to go out on a an ending like that like getting beat up by josh warrington um and i knew i knew it was better than that performance and i knew there was still more to more to come so i spoke to everybody and said look i believe i can still win a world title and that's what i intend to do and i'm fucking close enough like i've got myself yeah. in the position again mm-hmm. i'm one fight away from being mm-hmm. able to call myself a world so champion is that what happens though if you get a loss do you just like stay in the house and kind of gather your thoughts and think what am i going to do now i don't know i was, it I, was half, I was half depressed after yeah. that, that loss it was it was hard to take and you know christine helped me a lot and i wasn't depressed like i'm not going to say i was depressed a bit extreme but i was very mm-hmm. down um but you just had to think about it and and i thought about it and i just came up with a plan on my team we'll, we'll go to super featherweight go division up and fucking try to become a world champion again and it's it's close to happening how hard is it to go up a division it's i don't think it's i don't know i i was always so i when i was my first division was super bantamweight eight stone ten it killed me to do that weight um so the next division is nine stone so it's only four pounds so it wasn't hard for me to go mm-hmm. up to nine stone now i've kind of grown out of featherweight as well and now i'm a super featherweight nine stone four so um I don't think it's it, it's not that hard for me. I'm, What's your ultimate fight? What's a fight in your mind that you would love? Windsor Park. Um. Well, well, there's talk of if I beat, well, not if I beat, I'm going to beat this fucker yeah. Jamel Herring, but um, Shakur Stevenson, who's mm. one of the like fucking hottest prospects in boxing. They're talking about him like being just like you know similar to like Mayweather yeah, yeah, was that. back then. Like he's a very very good fighter, young gun. If I beat Jamel Herring, him at Windsor, that would be a fucking good one. Would you like to sign out at Windsor? That's 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 probably the plan, Windsor Park, because I think that this fight with Jamel probably not going to be a crowd. It's going to be in London. I think I'd like to finish with a fight at home in mm-hmm. Belfast and do it do it at Windsor Park. Go down weight again. Um, no, stay no, the same no, weight. stay the same, stay there, and the fight would probably. My next fight, if I beat Jamel Herring, You've got the belt. Then I'm the champion. But the next fight, the mandatory is Shakur Stevenson. Mm-hmm. So that's a huge fight. Yeah. a huge fight. And your training is spot on just now. Nah, I'm I'm feeling good, mate. I'm, I'm I'm where I need to be. I know, kind of in my head, I do these runs at home in Belfast called the Cave Hill. So it's a mm-hmm. big hill, and depending on how well I can do it, I can I kind of know when I'm ready to fight. And I've been smashing the Cave Hill. So I'm close. I'm close to being fight ready. Yeah. Um, Still a wee bit off. So how difficult is it to be away for your family? That's the hardest bit, mate. I, I'm away now. How many kids you got now? Two, wee boy and wee girl. So I know I watched a live video. I don't know if it was last week or an old one when you were doing a live with some news report and your wee man came out and oh, he did his ass wiped. He's a, my wee boy's a funny bastard. Mate. He's he's a character, like, but um, he's he's fucking he's hard work and but I've left her. I feel like I've yeah deserted him. Like I've left her at home alone homeschooling two kids and I'm fucking I'm over here training it's hard it's, yeah. it's the hardest bit mm-hmm. but if you're when you've got belts and stuff in the house man it must make your kids jank the wee man would you ever get a, put them into boxing um, do you know what see, or would no you try one, and keep them away see, well I wouldn't try to keep them away but knowing what a shark fucking infested game it is full of rats as well I've met some good people mm-hmm. and the people I'm with now at the minute are great people um, but there's some there's some sharks in this game so I'm not going to be forcing them into it 
I'm sure he's going to ask a question at some point and want to have a go. So I'll, I'll bring him down to the club and let him have a go. My wee girl, actually, I think she's very, very sporty. Yeah. And she'll get to the age where, where she'll want to probably tackle it too and have yeah. a go at boxing. The woman's game's rising, it's, though. It's massive, so man. And, and a lot of it down to Katie Taylor. And yeah. she's a huge name and yeah. such a lovely girl. And we have a girl in our gym called Chantel Cameron, mm-hmm. who's just won a world title. And I know big Savannah. Who Savannah just Marshall. Her. She's well, amazing she's, as well, man. She's a great girl. And yeah. She's going fight like fuck. Mm-hmm. She, she's Silent the only assassin. One that, I think she beat Clarissa Shields. That's right, yeah. And they're all fucked Oh, no, up. she's going to fight... I think she's she just beat the Scottish girl there. Aye. I think she's trying to get the one in America. So the Clarissa, Clarissa she, I think she beat the, her before. She beat her in the amateurs. Yeah. That's right. So the women's women's game's Fine, massive. Yeah. And I know my wee girl will want to have a go at it, but <laughs> fuck me. I couldn't, I couldn't stand this year yeah. with a black eye or busted <laughs> lip. Or, yeah, you're sitting there raging. So through all that, mate, you've had a um, phenomenal career. Mm. Phenomenal especially from being Northern Ireland going through all the troubles at the time to keep, try and keep the head what's the plans after boxing have you thought of that far I don't know um, hopefully I'd love to walk into a fucking punditry gig with BT or Sky or, or someone um, we'll get this podcast going mm-hmm. um, me and Chris um, I don't I don't know mate. Mm-hmm. I don't I don't want to do too much yeah. like I'm fucking I'm, I'm away all the time yeah. I like to sit in my arse mm-hmm. and relax for a while anyway mm-hmm. so does it how hard is it for a boxer to think right I need to pull the curtain shut is that very difficult I think it's hard for a lot um, but I don't like I'd like to say that I'm not daft and I know when is the right time to get out and I know that it's not right now but it's not too far away so is that um, hard because you see a lot of boxers coming back in their 40s well, some in their him. 50s I watched the Mike Tyson fight I thought he was actually brilliant yeah he looked good didn't I he? thought he looked great but um, that's something I hope do I you battle do. with that though? Um, because you're a fighter and you, you, it's in I your blood. I don't know. I don't think. I, I like that. Like, I don't like training. I train because I fucking have to because it's my job. Yeah. So I'd, I think I'd like to sit on my arse and chill mm-hmm. out for a while. Do you and think just spend you could bit, though? I think I could. Mm-hmm. If I have something to do, see if the podcast, like once a week or something, being away, yeah, just that, would, busy. that would be enough for me. Mm-hmm. But um, these, these fights, all the old timers coming back, and I know they're not like, they're fights, they're, but they're not real professional fights. But they're making fortunes. Fair play to them. Like, yeah. fucking Roy Jones and Tyson's made a fortune. I talk mm-hmm. about Tyson and Vander Holyfield now, and I don't know if I'd ever do that. Maybe, tell you one fight I would come back for, Barry McGuigan fight. <laughs> I'll make you one. I'll make a few quid yeah, as well. That would be mega. Yeah. Would well, you love to, so that's basically just put to bed with all them then. And no, then, that's, that's, that's just done. Mm-hmm. I, uh, yeah, I'm sure I'll see them at, at things because we're, we're in this boxing game, but, I just I, I don't Is there know. any boxers out there who you've came across and you've absolutely hated them after the fight still? There was a kid called um and he's probably the only one, Chris Chris Avalos, an American I fought, and he was a loudmouth and he was a he was a fucking prick. His um at the press conference, his family were horrible people too, just arseholes. Mm-hmm. His mother, I think it was, picked a bit of chewing gum out of her mouth and <laughs> fucking threw it at me <laughs> from the stage. Uh. Um, it's just they were dickheads and I remember mm. thinking I stopped him in the fifth round like he had to get the oxygen mask on he was fucked and like brought out wasn't even in the ring to, when I was getting my hand raised like he was already fucking mm-hmm. stretchered out and I remember going into that fight thinking I'm going to knock this fucker out and I'm not going to shake his hand after the fight he can fuck off like you know everyone yeah. there's all animosity and then everyone hugs yeah. and stuff there's always a bit of respect mm-hmm. but I didn't turns out I didn't have to do it because he was off to the hospital. Anyway, yeah. what, what was it like fighting in Vegas? Vegas is magic. I, I love it. It's one of my favorite places in the world. Like, um, you know, fighting in the MGM. Never ever imagined that was going to happen. Fought, you know, your name up on lights mm-hmm. with fucking beside David Copperfield on the MGM fucking yeah. Grand. It's mm-hmm. magic. Like, I remember actually Floyd Mayweather was at the fight. So he was at the fight watching me in Santa Cruz and he'd done, a, he'd done an interview. Um, and so I think I think the MGM it's not the biggest stadium in the world I think it holds about 12,000 yeah. and there was probably 10 there at my fight so plenty plenty of support obviously and plenty of people watching but they've done an interview with Mayweather at ringside and says you know this is amazing you know we haven't seen a, a British fighter bring as many fans over to, to Vegas since you fought Ricky Hatton and all he said was 
yeah, but there was no empty seats when I fought Ricky Hatton. Then he just walked away. <laughs> <laughs> I remember going, oh, you bastard. Prick, yeah. but, Oh. Ray Hatton, but you got to give you you got to give him credit. He fought Hatton Mayweather sold and Pacquiao. Out. Hatton sold that out himself. It yeah. wasn't fucking Mayweather sold mm-hmm. that out. He's, did he? He fought in Manchester as well. Hatton did they not? Man nah. City's ground. Yeah, he, he fought. Done, he done fifty five thousand yeah. there. But he was Hatton was an enigma. Like he's fucking. Why is that? Like some why is it some fans grasp to certain people? Is um, it because one of the lads he, kind of mentality? One of the lads um, keeps that fucking he trains hard, exciting fighter. But has the same mindset mm-hmm. as he did when he was yeah. on the housing estate growing up, mm-hmm. and and that's why and that's why they love him. Because you look at Joshua, he's kind of the poster boy, the body, and kind of he's never in trouble. Mm. And then you've got Tyson Fury, who's hit depression, been bang on the Charlie, and yeah. fucked that, and then come back fighting. But yet, he he's more relatable. Yeah, he is. Do you know what I mean? Because yeah. everybody's kind of but struggling. Hatton, Hatton was there's there's no one. I don't think there's anyone ever going to get to the level of. Um, well, they're going to have the fan base that, that Ricky Hatton had. It was insane what he done. Yeah. Absolutely that insane. Was phenomenal, man. Do you think he, his career could have went further, though, if he didn't? Because his weight used to have got him down. That, that is was, that bad for a boxer? Yeah, absolutely. He's a dude. You know, I would go... Half two, a stone a stone, No, but two stone over, mm. over fighting weight, which is enough. Hatton used to do four. Yeah. So, four fucking stone. Like, that's... <laughs> I don't know Kerry Kays who does yeah. my cuts he's my cut man uh-huh. he was Ricky's nutritionist mm-hmm. and he says it was just a battle to lose weight not get ra- not you weren't getting ready for a fight you were getting ready to make weight mm-hmm. so he says it was a battle and obviously it's a fight you can only do that for so long yeah. like, fuck me four stone every every single camp you yeah. lose it's, it's gotta be bad in yeah. what about this guy you're fighting then would you think his fighting weight will be after the weigh-in um I don't know. I think I think we'll be a similar weight. I, I think don't so. think he's going to be much bigger than me. Um, I, th- I I'll be going in the ring. So fights at nine stone four. We'll both weigh in at nine four. I'll be going in the ring at ten stone. He'll be going in just over maybe 10. 10 two yeah. or something like that. So what's your prediction for that? A win. I'll, I'll always predict a win, mm-hmm. but I feel like I could get rid of this guy. Um, I'm just I'm just up for this one. You like, will really up for it. You will. I fucking do my best. To, yeah. Whatever it takes to have my hand raised, like mm-hmm. that's that's what I'm going to do. And no matter the outcome. Once you win after it, it's this is kind of icing on the cake. So after comes yeah, after you, this, it's, just, it's a bonus. Absolute yeah. bonus. Yeah. Could you go up another level? Nah, not too much. I'm too small. I'm like I'm a realist. I'm fucking. They're too big up. Mm-hmm. Or lightweights. Fucking Tiffy more Lopez and. That and Lopez fucking, is a different animal. Oh, Who was the boy got the body shot done to him last week? Two weeks ago. Uh, Luke Campbell got Luke Campbell. dropped by mm-hmm. Garcia. Garcia and our big lump. They're, they're too big yeah. for these boys and too, and too young as well probably <laughs> <laughs> get, me and her are, I'm 34 my next birthday I think he's he's about the fucking same age as my dad I think he's fucking <laughs> both, both of us are middle yeah. aged now so through all that amazing career brother what's the plans for the future after it all I know you want to do the kind of entertainment kind of things do you have any more kids or are you kind I'd, of settled I'd, I don't know I'd love an our kids you know but I don't know if, if do you feel as if you miss a big part of their life when yeah, you're I training do, yeah. I as miss, much? Yeah, I miss so much of my kids' lives growing up. Um, I think my, my missus always says, like, if I had to retire when I says I was going to retire at 30, we'd have maybe had four kids. But mm-hmm. it's too hard, like, leaving her and me yeah. going to the camps all the time and leaving her with three or four kids. Mm-hmm. So I'd like an R one. I'd like, um, I'll try and twist her arm, like, but I, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, listen, brother Carol, for coming on today, telling your story I'm buzzing for your next fight mate you will win and once you're back on again with that title um, we'll take it from there but I'm happy to come on your podcast for anybody watching I'll leave, going to leave all, all the links in the description for any young boxer maybe young kid up and coming it's try to be a boxer what advice would you give for them always remember that it's a hard sport it's it's tough and to get to the top you have to make like any anything you want to succeed in you have to make sacrifices mm. but it's a fucking hard sport and if you want to make a career out of it understand now that you're going to make sacrifices and you're going to be fucked a lot of the time because it's a hard game but it's all been worth it for me yeah Carol listen all the best to your next fight brother take care Check out more of my podcasts on the right and be sure to like, share and comment your thoughts on this week's podcast. Thank you.